he was God the Son. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit lived in perfect unison, eternity passed. So the concept of Christ did not come for the first time as a babe in, in uh, the womb of Mary. It was a miracle. Remember, if you uh, remember, we defined what a divine miracle is many, many weeks ago, and uh, let me read it again. A divine miracle is an extraordinary event or phenomenon that is considered to be the result of divine intervention, transcending the laws of nature and human understanding. Divine miracles are often seen as signs or manifestations of God's power, love, or presence, and are usually believed to be beyond the explanation of science or natural causes. Certainly, the birth of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ qualifies as that. Amen? A divine miracle is an extraordinary event or phenomenon that is considered to be the result of divine intervention. Praise God for divine intervention. Uh, and so we're going to look at this today. We're going to see four things in this passage. We're going to look at first, the angel's announcement to Mary. Second, Mary's confused reply. Third, the angel's assurance. And fourth, Mary's faithful declaration. So we're going to look at the announcement, her reply, the angel's assurance, and Mary's faithful declaration as a servant of the Lord. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, I'm so delighted to be in this building with the people of God here at AFM to worship your Son, empowered by your Spirit. And now I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just take over this preaching and that you would take it from the ears to the hearts of everyone present. For some, it might be a new truth, and we praise God for that. For others, it'll be a reaffirmation of a truth they've known. And may we just celebrate the goodness of you, God, in the sending of your son. Yes, a babe born in the manger, but he was born to die for the sins of the world, my sins. And that he was raised on the third day, praise God, assuring us that one day we too will be raised from the dead who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Now bless this study of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we get started this morning, let's just read our text. And uh, it begins in verse 26 of chapter 1 of Luke, and it reads the following. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, the angel, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end." And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your uh, relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. And here it is, guys. For nothing will be impossible with God. Amen. Amen? Nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the, behold the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. We're going to start by looking at the announcement itself, pretty spectacular announcement, don't you think? In verses uh, 26 through 33, when, and coming in, the angel says to her, Gabriel sent by God to her, says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Can you imagine? You're minding your own business in your own little cottage of a house, and all of a sudden there an angel appears and says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. And then like any of the rest of us, verse 29 tells us she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus. No baby book is necessary. The name's been picked from eternity past. Amen. 
Jesus. That name means the one who saves. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. You know, forever in the Greek means forever. And his kingdom will have no end. What a scene. The angel Gabriel comes to this small village, and, and I was reading about that in this small village. There might have been a couple hundred people that lived in this small village. It was a hamlet, if you will, to the house where Mary resides, and then says to her, do not be afraid. Greeting, favored one, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and shall name him Jesus. John MacArthur says of this announcement, he says, the angel Gabriel was sent by God with a revelation. Revelation, making something known. That would be the most significant birth announcement the world has ever known. Amen? Amen. Heralding the most monumentally significant event in human history, the birth of the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Normally, guys, I'm really good at using my sanctified imagination to picture the scene. I struggle with this scene. Mary, minding her own business, we have no idea what she was doing at the house at that moment. Well, she, you know, and, no, and by the way, most theologians think Mary was probably between the ages of 13 and 15. Can you imagine? You're between 13 and 50, 13, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in that range. And all of a sudden an angel appears and says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. And then tells her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What an announcement. I, I can't imagine what Mary must have been feeling and sensing at that moment, right? First off, that an angel came, right? That an angel even appeared, and then what an announcement the angel makes to her. Not only are you favored, Mary, by God, who in here wouldn't want God to tell you you are a favored one, yeah. right? But I would submit to you the more spiritual you are, the more that might trouble you because you know yourself, Amen? You know yourself. And you know that we're just sinners saved by grace. And she announced, and the angel announces to her, not only greetings, favored one, uh, you have found favor with the Lord, the Lord is with you. But then he hits her with this. In verse 31, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Now she is a virgin. She's never known any kind of physical relationship with man. But here is an angel telling this 13, 14, 15-year-old girl, not only are you favored, guess what? You're going to have a child. And not any kind of child. You're going to have God's child. I can't even fathom that. Can you? What Mary must have been thinking. Sarah, 15, I believe, was baptized this morning. Could you imagine that, that God would say to a, a, a 13, 14, 15 year old girl, your favorite, God knows your name. She's lived in obscurity in a little village, and now she knows for sure that God himself, the one that sits on an eternal throne, the one that spoke everything, he knows her. Can I love you for a minute and tell you something? God knows you. Now, for some of us, that might alarm us because of the lies we're living. And you need to know God knows you. Right? You've heard me say a million times, you can't make a room dark enough, travel down a gravel road far enough, no matter what country songs tell you, and think you're getting away with anything with God. God knows us. He knows us by name. He knows the amount of hairs on our head. God is saying to this little obscure girl in an obscure village, not only do I know you, you're favored by God, and you have been chosen by God to bear his son. I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, this week I'm looking at it with my sanctified imagination, and I, I, I've never been a wor girl. I don't play one on TV. I, 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 yeah, I believe whatever you come out of the womb, that's what you are. If you're a boy, you're a boy forever. Amen. And if you're a girl, you're a girl forever. Amen. And just because you're a tomboy girl, it's all right to be a tomboy and climb trees and play baseball and spit, but you're a girl. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> I mean, so not only does God say, I know you, Mary, you're a favored one. How favored? You're going to bear a son in your womb. 
And you, I've already picked his name out for you. His name is going to be Jesus. I think for Christmas Eve, I'm going to do a devotional sermon. So rather than preach like I always do till I get done, I'm just going to preach till I'm finished. Okay, but, but listen. <laughs> listen to me. That name was picked from eternity past. You know what Jesus means? It ain't the one who saves. Right? Names to the, to the Jews mean something. We pick our names out of a, a book based on, or a soap opera based on how cool we think the name is. His name will be called Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. I can't fathom what this must have done to Mary. We see her response immediately in verses 28 and 29. Look, and coming in after he says, greetings, favor, when the Lord is with Notice the very next verse, she was like any of us would have been, but she was very perplexed at the statement, you think? I mean, she's a virgin. How is she going to conceive a son? But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was that that phrase, very perplexed in the Greek, means greatly troubled, disturbed, or confused. I'm sure she was all three. Greatly troubled, disturbed, or confused. What on earth am I being told? One theologian wrote this week, Mary was greatly troubled at the presence of God's angel Gabriel because Mary understood, as do all those who seek after God, that we are sinners. And so Mary was confused by the greeting itself, favored one, the Lord is with you. Why would God seek me out of all the women to visit? You know Mary was thinking that. I mean, what was, what was being said to her, what was going to be asked of her, she was very, the Bible says, perplexed, greatly troubled, disturbed, and confused. And then Mary says, in verse 30, 31, the angel says, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, in an instance, at the resurrection, what were those ladies told? Don't be afraid, amen? He is not here for he is risen, just as he said. We have nothing to fear as the children of God. No matter what the news says. Listen, I'm telling you, if you watch too much news, it's going to make you crazy. For every half hour of news, do a half hour in the Bible. Because that's the only way you're going to balance any of that mess out. Am I right? I mean, there are times just on my uh, Twitter timeline as I'm reading the news and I, I'm looking at the, the absolute debauchery that's going on in Washington and I'm devastated. And if I just look at that without reading this, God's still in charge. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament, Galatians 4, 4, but when in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God's in charge. It doesn't look like it, right? It doesn't, by what we see, it certainly doesn't look like it, but let me tell you this. God is in charge, and if you need something to read to calm the fears that might be in your heart based on what you're seeing in the world, go home and read Psalm 2, and that'll clear it all up for you. Just go home and read Psalm 2. This said, not now. When you go home, read Psalm 2. Write it down, Psalm 2. And it'll give you peace about what's going on. And then the angel says to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now notice, Mary's perplexed at the possibility, right? As she's troubled, disturbed, confused, and now he's saying she's going to bear a child. And Mary said what any virgin would say, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And now all that means is she's had no sexual relations with any man. You would imagine how confused she would be with that kind of announcement. Three reasons why God chose a virgin to bring forth his son. There might be more, but there's three for sure. Number one, the significance of the virgin birth is because it fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 7, 11 through 16. Let's look at that, Isaiah 7, 11 through 16. Now, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus actually came. Look at it. Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as shill or high as heaven. 
or we go on, go on the next verse. Go on. Okay, let's back up. Just wanted to make sure. Go back. Let's read it from Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God and make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven, Sheol meaning the grave. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us, right? Look at verse 15. He will eat curds and honey at the time. He knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. And so that's prophecy for the Old Testament Jews. But God said a virgin was going to bear a son hundreds of years before it actually happened. Listen, you know why it's important that every Old Testament prophecy gets fulfilled? Because if God doesn't even fulfill one of them, how can you trust any of them? Every Old Testament prophecy concerning his coming before, concerning his return or concerning anything else that gets fulfilled, it is important that we understand we can trust God's word on any and all matters. The second reason why the virgin birth was necessary is it validated Jesus as God's son. Look at Luke 1 verse 35 of our text. Look at what it says. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called what? The Son of God. He picked a virgin and he was bringing his son, dropping his son into her womb. And it was why she was still a virgin so that when he was born, there would be no mistake that he was called the Son of God. God the Father is God the Son's Father, amen? Amen. And listen, he had to do that because Jesus is the God-man, God and man, fully God, fully man, right? And it validated Jesus as God's son. And if you know this story, it goes on, Joseph had no physical relations with Mary until after Jesus was born. Why? Because there was going to be no doubt whose son this was. And so Joseph had no physical relations with Mary until after the birth of the Son of God. That's reason number two. It validated Jesus, Son of God. Third, and I say this often to y'all, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ was important because it bypassed the sin-tainted seed of man. Look at Romans 5.12. And this is significant in the virgin birth. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, who is the man? Adam. That's all right. That's what we do. We, we know what the end of the thing is. Adam. Therefore, just one. And remember, Eve was deceived and ate. Adam freely ate. He was not deceived. The Bible doesn't say Adam was deceived too. Eve gave to him and he ate. For, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and when sin entered in the world, what did it bring? It bred death, right? For the wages of sin is what? Death, right? So sin enters the world, it brings forth death through the sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, which is why Hebrews 9 tells us the point under man wants to die, that's just the judgment, right? There's two deaths that, that it's talking about here, physical death. We're all going to die unless Jesus returns in our generation, right? We're all going to taste death. But in the garden, immediately what they tasted was spiritual death. We were, we were alienated from God, right? We were as... Uh, uh, as Paul writes in, in uh, one of his letters, we were in Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So we literally, every baby that's ever been born to man since that point up until the birth of Christ was born dead spiritually and will one day die physically. God bypassed the tainted seed of Joseph to plant his son, his holy, righteous son, into the womb of Mary so that when he came out of that womb, he was not only God's son, but he was fully God, fully man, and without sin. So the angel, after Mary's perplexed and he's assured her, notice what he says in verses 35 through 37 to, to Mary. 
You know her head was spinning. You know she was rocked by the announcement about what he said. Look at verse 35, 36, 37. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the, Holy, the Most High will overshadow you. You know, once I was preaching on this and I, I made a mistake in my, in my uh, words and said that the Holy Spirit hovered, hoovered over her like a vacuum sweeper. No, it was hovered. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And there's always young people here that love to tell me when I get it wrong, right? Preacher, do you know what you said? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, he's saying, Mary, listen to me. Behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. So Mary, uh, 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 Elizabeth, and, and the fact that she's with child, uh, at, at, in an old age barren is proof positive there's nothing impossible with God, which is what he says in verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Praise God. Amen. Overshadow you means to surround, to encompass, in a metaphorical sense, to influence. The Spirit of God hovered over Mary and planted the seed of the Son of God in her womb. He was born like any other baby was born through the womb of woman, but he was unlike any other baby and the fact that he was not tainted with the seed of man. The creative influence of the Spirit of God would overshadow Mary to produce a child in her womb. The angel said, Mary, how God was going to place his son in his womb. And MacArthur uh, says, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ is foundational to Christianity since it is the only way to explain how Jesus could be the God-man, fully God and fully man. Jesus was always fully God and fully man. The angel Gabriel's declaring a stunning truth about God. Mary's head was spinning. You know it was. And when he says in verse 37, for nothing. Now, I didn't look up nothing in the Greek, but you know what nothing means in the Greek? For nothing. Listen to me, church. For nothing will be impossible with God. Man, there's a message right there for any of us, right? Right? Like, I don't know what you're going through right now or your family or whatever, but I can tell you this, nothing is impossible with God. And you know how I know that? Because I'm living proof that there's nothing impossible with God. You that don't know me don't understand. I was a homeless drug dude wandering the streets of Evansville ready to take my life because I was sick of living, and God said, no, no introduced me to his son, and from that homelessness to here is because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, some of you have some children that maybe have drifted, and they're not what they should be. I want you to hear me when I tell you nothing's impossible with God. Some of you wives have husbands who aren't here today, and, and they don't love God, and they want nothing to do with the church, and they want nothing to do with anything that you are involved in in, in, in Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's nothing impossible with God. There's nothing impossible with God. How should that change our prayer life? Like, right? Like, sometimes, I don't know, do we, do we come to God hoping, wishing? No, no, no. I'm coming to the sovereign God of all that is, and I'm coming to him with my petitions because I know this about God. There's nothing he can't do. Nothing, including planting the seed of his son into the womb of Mary after planting the seed of John the Baptist in Elizabeth. And then finally, let's look at Mary's faithful declaration concerning the miracle of his birth, and this is important for us. In verse 38, and Mary said, after he said, in verse 37, there's nothing impossible with God, Mary said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. Notice the phrase Mary uses to define herself before the angel. She said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord. And bond slave can be translated the word slave. John MacArthur says about this, her humble response demonstrated Mary's willing submission to God's unfolding purpose. Have we done that? Her humble response demonstrated Mary's willing submission to God's unfolding purpose. She saw herself as nothing more than his willing, humble slave responded by saying, behold, the bond slave of the Lord. Now, listen, when Mary agreed to this, you need to understand 
Someone that committed adultery or fornication in the Old Testament law. You know what it was supposed to be done? There, there'd be take out, stone, killed. What would a reputation be in town? We're all worried about a reputation, right? What would people think about me? Would Joseph, her betrothed, he was going to put her away. We know that if we read in Matthew, he was going to put her away quietly. He didn't want to harm her, but he wanted to be true to God. And here she is pregnant. And until the angel appears to Joseph, you got to have relationship to be pregnant. He doubted her. What would the community think about her? Would she be taken out and stoned? She would face shame and ridicule. Unmarried women who are pregnant to this day get whispered about. I know that firsthand. The whispering that goes on in restaurants. The fingers that get pointed. Especially if it's a pastor's kid. What Mary agreed to was no simple thing. She was risking everything in listening to the Lord and saying, okay, God, if this is your word to me, let's do this. Is that how we respond? AFM exists because one day the Lord came to me in my heart, not audibly, I didn't see an angel, and said, leave your Southern Baptist past pulpit and I want to start a new work with you. Resign today. And when everyone was going through the line, hugging my neck, some were crying, maybe some were clapping. And people said, where are you going to live? I don't know. How are you going to earn a living? I don't know. It's just what God told me to do. 25 years later, you see, sometimes what God asks out of us seems so crazy on the front end. And we won't see the blessings of the obedience until after we're obedient. He didn't provide all this and say, now move, Jim. He said, move, and I moved, and he provided all this. Mary said yes to God. She ignored the fact that she was a virgin. She ignored the fact that Joseph might put her away. She ignored the fact that the community, what the community might think about her, the, fate, the shame and the ridicule. You say, oh, yeah, but it was God's son. Listen, these are real world issues that Mary was facing. And yet Mary said, behold. She beholded the angel back, huh? He said, behold. And she said, all right, behold you. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary said, Behold, I'm raising your behold with my behold, the bond slave of the Lord. That's how Mary saw herself as a slave of God. Did you know all of the New Testament saints that wrote those scriptures all said that about themselves? Romans 1 1, Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. Colossians 1 7, just as you learned it from Ephaphras, our beloved bondservant who is faithful servant of Christ. James 1 1, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter and 2 Peter 1 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude 1 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That who we are. If God graces you with breath in your lungs tomorrow morning and he allows you to get out of bed, we report for duty. He's in charge. And if we're going to be faithful, then we need to listen for his commands to us. It's not about what we want, it's about what he wants. And listen, what he wants is so much greater than what you think you want. Mary said, behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. That's, that's the Christian life. Sally, when we get in the word of God and, and, and the Holy Spirit's revealing to us, do this, don't do that. Because people say, ah, oh, you know, religion's about do's and don'ts. No, relationship with Christ is about do's. There's do's and don'ts in the relationship with Christ. There are things we should do and there are things we shouldn't do. The things we do are to make much of him. The things we're not to do is to, so that we make much of him. My whole journey in Christ has been weird. And I'm not going to go over it again. But it's been weird. People have always looked at me like I was strange. 
(laughs) When I tell them what God is telling me to do, they look at me like, are you outside your mind? Well, sort of, because he's in heaven and he orders my steps. And even though everything I've, I mean, it just, I don't have time. You don't have time. You old timers don't want to hear it again. If you're as old as me, you might hear it like again for the first time. I was homeless when he saved me. Then he put me in college. Really? Me? And I met a redhead, junior class president. I'm, a fr- I'm older than she is. I'm still her elder, but she was a fr- I was a freshman. She was a junior. She was a somebody. I was a nobody. But God said, I got a plan. And so that plan was for her to come sit at my lunch table. And introduce herself to me. And I'm telling you, from the day I met her to this day, 41 years later, I am head over heels in love with that woman. And God used her in my life. We got married. And he used her because I had no clue how to write a term paper. So he sent me a smart woman. who knew how to construct papers. I knew what I wanted to say because I, I, I like to talk. The only fights we ever had were at midnight when I had a deadline the next day to get a term, uh, some kind of paper written in, and she's trying to make sense of all my run-on. I told you I'm the king of run-on. I just write. And, and I just throw uh, commas. and sen- I just, They're decoration. I have no clue. How, uh, to this day, I'm a college graduate, psych major, I know. I don't have a clue the difference between a semicolon and a colon. Colon's what you got in your body, right? I got no idea. Commas, apostrophes, I got quotation marks down. So he sends me a woman to marry that got all that down. Nothing was plagiarized, it was my word, she just made it make sense. After much debate, I never thought I'd be a father. I was just a wild child, and God blessed us with three children, and then a fourth. And then I had to, I, I've got, we, we have got 16 grandkids. We haven't caught the Conrads yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Talked to Tim last night, and I told him, we're not done. And he put me in ministry. There's no way. There's just no way. Very first sermon I ever preached, my, my oldest brother, who was like a father to me, fell asleep. Front row, fell asleep. <laughs> fell asleep. Afterwards, he told me what a great job I did. <laughs> Went to college, got my degree. Went to North Carolina as an executive with the, Boy, the old Boy Scouts. I always have to say this, the old Boy Scouts. And God kept tugging, tugging. You're not doing what I want you to do. I've called you. My hand's upon you. I've told you the story. I know it. You said, Pastor, you said you weren't going to do this, and here you are doing it. I got a wild promotion offer from my boss to be the field director of Southeast North Carolina after two and a half years. That normally you don't get it to like 10 years. And he was offering it to me. I would move to Wilmington, North Carolina, beautiful city and, and next to the beach in which I love the beach. And, and uh, at that same time, God was tugging on my heart. And I was at a crossroads and I knew it. And I laid out a fleece before the Lord. I don't know what you think about fleeces. I wasn't testing the Lord. I wasn't trying to get him to do for me because honestly I wanted to take the promotion I wanted to move to Wilmington I I had run for years away from the ministry and and I said two days you get two days Lord if in two days I haven't heard from a church by the way remember this I never told anybody about this prayer Trudy and I are the only ones that knew my my pastor didn't know two days Lord if I don't hear from a church I'm taking a promotion. I'll serve you as a lay person. I'll be a deacon. I'll be a Sunday school teacher, whatever. 
Second day came, and I got a phone call from my pastor, CJ, and he said, Jim, a church has been inquiring about you. I hung on the phone, Trudy, oh, yeah. And I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I said, a church, that's CJ. But 20 minutes later, the phone rang, and it was Alan Norris, the pulpit committee chairman of White's Creek Baptist Church in Bladen County, North Carolina. He didn't ask me to carry his, his only begotten son. But I'm telling you, God is asking all of us to walk in faith, listening to his word, obeying what he says to do. And I want to tell you this, blessing is on the other side of obedience. Amen. Most of us operate this way, God bless me and I'll do it. And God said, no, 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 there's no faith in that. Amen. Do what I tell you to do. And I promise blessing on the other side. That's what Mary had to realize. She was being told that she was going to carry God's son. She was a child in our estimation, 13, 14, 15. She was going to carry God's son. And all of that had to be racing through her head about what are people going to say? What, is Joseph going to leave me? How will he ever believe that I'm, I'm still a virgin? And, and what will my mom, what, what will the community, what will the synagogue, all these scenes racing through her head. And, and the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, just said, Mary, don't be fearful. God's got you. And Mary did what all of us do. She surrendered her life. She said, okay, I'll do it. And she became the human vehicle to bring Jesus Christ, the Son of God, into the world. What a miracle. And the world dismisses it. There are uh, liberal theologians that dismiss the importance of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know how they can do that if they've ever read the Bible, but they swear they can. Listen, let me tell you something. He had to be born of a virgin so that it, there'd be no doubt he was the son of God. Joseph, even after they were married, had no relations with her until after Jesus was born. He is who he said he was, the son of God, God the son. And Jesus came to this earth so that he could die on a cross for the sins of the world after having lived a perfect sinless life for 33 and a half years and then to be betrayed and to be strung up by the Roman oppressors and to be crucified, the most grueling, horrible death there is known at that time to mankind. And he willingly went to the cross for you and I. He willingly went so he could absorb the wrath of holy God instead of us. And at the cross, he gave me his righteousness and I gave him my sin. All of the ugly, nasty sin was placed upon Christ. He who knew no sin became sin in order that we might be made. We were made, we didn't do it. It's at the exchange at the cross. If, if, if you were born again at the cross, whether you know it or not, at the cross, you gave God, uh, uh, Jesus, all your sin, and he gave you his righteousness so that when God looks at you and I, if we're born again, he looks at us and says, you are my child. You are the beloved in Christ. You are one of mine. And he doesn't see my perfection. He sees the perfection of his son on my life. So even when I fail my father, when he looks at me, yes, he'll chastise me, but he sees the blood of his son applied to my life. And just like none of my kids can be unborn, listen, don't believe that nonsense that you can somehow lose what you never gave yourself in the first place. You didn't do anything to get your salvation and you can't do anything to keep your salvation. It is for by grace are you saved through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God for you. And I want to say this to you in closing. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never really dealt with the fact that you are a sinner and the wrath of God abides on you, right now it hovers over your head. And when you die and you have no idea when that your sand and your hourglass is going to get, but it is going to end and you will die. And if you die without Christ, you're going to perish and be cast into the lake of fire. That's what the scriptures teach. That's not me scaring you. It's what the scriptures teach. 
But the good news is, not only is God holy, he's a God of love, grace, and mercy, and he sent his son to die so you don't have to die in your sin, but what you have to do is surrender your life to Jesus Christ. They're gonna put my stuff up on that screen, my phone number, my email, listen to me. The greatest gift you could give yourself this Christmas is by receiving the gift that God's got for you through his son, Jesus Christ. Sarah saved, Deshay saved, had the privilege of leading, amen, yeah. Deshay and Cody sat at our kitchen table and after presenting the gospel, passing her why questions, she said, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Are you? Have you? I'm not talking about praying some prayer when you were nine. Are you following Jesus? Is he Lord of your life? Or did you just pray some prayer because your best friend did at 9, 10, 11? There might be kids now that saw the baptism, saw the applause, and they might go home and say, hey, I'd like to be baptized. Just ask them one question. Why? Why? If they don't understand they're a sinner, if the only way out of the judgment of God is Christ, they're not ready. So tell them to push aside the baptism and start sharing the gospel with them. I love you. I'm glad you were here. Next Christmas Eve, next week. It'd be easy to say it's Christmas Eve. I think I'll just stay home and get ready for Christmas. Listen, if he is indeed the reason for the season, we're going to be here, right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you. And I'm so thankful today that you allowed me the privilege of participating in the baptism of two of your children. I'm so thankful for both of them, Father. And as long as they're under the, uh, my preaching, I pray that you'll use me to help them grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And Father, I'm not naive to think that there aren't others sitting here today, Father, who have never really yielded their life to Christ. Oh, they prayed a prayer and they got dunked, God, but they, are no, they never even for one minute have ever yielded their life to Christ. They've never taken the yoke of Christ upon them. God, the, the scariest person in the whole world is a religious person who doesn't understand what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So, Father, I pray for the religious in this room right now. Oh, they come to church give a little money, but they don't cry out like Mary does. Behold, be it done unto me a bond slave of the Lord. May this be the day that they radically have their lives altered and their eternity settled. Father, please use the word of God to reach people who need your son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for all that you've done in my life to take me from homeless to this. I hope it can be a great witness to others because there's nothing impossible with God. There are people that, have, that think they've sinned away their opportunity. Father, help them to understand where, grace, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Your grace is sufficient to cover our sin if they'll just come to the foot of the cross. And acknowledge, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I deserve the wrath of God, the judgment of God. I deserve hell. But God, today I believe that Jesus is who he said he was and that he came and he lived the perfect life and he died the sacrificial death. And on the third day, he arose from the dead. And today I'm placing my trust, hope, and faith in Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 